Right, this is going to be another one of my donated discussions, and I am joined here by Frisky, and he is first time appearance on the show. So as always, I mean, there's no one else here, so you'd have to talk first anyway. But what I usually like to do is, if people could just give someone like the lay of the land, if they're listening, what esports games are you into? What regions are you into, etc.? Right. So uh, I've mainly followed League of Legends. Uh, I've followed it since like 2014 when I started playing it. Um, took a break from a bit, but then came back to the esports. Uh, really enjoying this uh, the kind of last couple years of the meta. Uh, um, I used to follow Counter Strike. I still do, like more casually. I used to be like a little bit more involved with it, um, but I've kind of like relaxed on Counter Strike a bit just to like focus on League. Um, I also um, am a big like follower of the FGC and Smash Brothers community. Um, but my my main interest is in League, um, and mainly right now, actually not even mainly right now, mainly like forever. I've always more been interested in LCK and LPL. I sometimes tune into LEC, but not really like L- LCS as much. It's just like the, you know, it rots your brain after a while of how bad the, you know, the competition is there. So L- LCK and LPL keep me the most interested. Okay. What's the most interesting topic right now? What team are you into? What, what's going on for you right now in, in either? Uh, well, the the kind of difference of the leagues, I think, is really like interesting right now to me because... LCK to me seems like a little bit weaker than I'm used to the top kind of you take like the, the the playoff teams, the top six, like not all of them are like super like skilled. I mean, you have T1 that's, you know, kind of been dropping off. They were already kind of dropping off when uh, Faker um, sure. before Faker left. Um, but, they you know, they're kind of dropping off further. Um, uh, KT and Genji are really the only ones that I think are like can be decent, um, like internationally. And I even think they uh, well, could have some inter- if issues internationally, but I've been really interested in KT right now. I've really enjoyed their rise. Okay. I mean, if, if people don't know, like Genji hasn't lost at all. So in theory, they're number one. And actually the two teams do play this upcoming week. But at Monty, I, I know, actually thinks KT is the like secret real number one team in Korea. Like, what do you like about KT at the moment? They're, um, sorry, let me just open up my notes on KT just to get all the good stuff. They're kind of their mix of their players. I really like, Um, you know, first of all, you've got Keen, who I'm just so happy that Keen is on like a team that he doesn't have bad people on because it's been years and years and years that people haven't been able to know Keen's name uh, for being like on. He was on the Afrika team back in 2018. uh, And, you know, that was a really bad era of Korean League of Legends. So they, you know, maybe he's not known as well much. Um, But the fact that he's still like consistently doing so well and like now has a team to boot for it uh, is uh, makes me really happy. And I think he's got the teammates around him. Uh, BDD is, I think, I actually think he doesn't get enough credit as just being a super strong, just, uh, en- uh, enchanter player, uh, just really solid, always in the laning phase, can roam really well. Um, you know, not always like somebody who's going to be like fully on carrying the games just from the, his kind of style and from his champion picks, um, but is really good at like uh, facilitating his laners. And they do that a lot with aiming. Um, I've been, I've watched aiming uh, for a couple years. I remember watching him on the old, um, on the old BLG team, the one prior to when they added uh, Uzi I back in 2021. And I was always a little iffy on him, but like this, um, uh, this split, or the, not this, just the split this year, uh, has really like really upped his stock for me. I've really enjoyed watching him play. He's like clearly one of the best um, ADCs in the world. Um, and having BDD there to kind of roam and facilitate his lane, get him ahead, because um, coming down there as well, um, I think makes um, you know gets a, it's allows to aiming to you know pop off almost maybe not whenever he wants, but like gives him more resources to do so. Because the idea is that Keen doesn't really need the resources. He's you know he's going to be okay on his own. Um, yeah, so I just, I really just kind of like that, and it's just the first time KT uh, has been good in you know what five years I think since the the um, super team. Sure, I mean they were obviously good in spring too, but. I, yeah, well, that's what I meant this year, yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, the thing for me with this team is because KT Roaster has lost, like, the luster of the name KT, like, that doesn't actually, aside from when it's the telecom war, I think most people are Westerners because they haven't seen him internationally. They actually don't even know if it's a good team now. They assume it's just, like, nothing, and they probably look at the names. And like you're saying, aside from BDD, because even Kaz had his ups and downs, 
And may, maybe they respect lands. Maybe that's like a little bit of a point. I would say the rest of them are just unknown by Westerners. Like the saddest thing of all is, you know how Reddit memes just collect over time. It's like a game of telephone that you get passed from one person to another. And by the right. end, the person saying them doesn't even know the origin of the meme and he doesn't even know if it's a joke. So this will probably tilt you. But if you've ever seen on Reddit, if you mention Keen, people joke and go, ha, you mean licorice's son? Because of that oh, world that you're talking about where Cloud9 won that one series over them, where quite frankly, it looked to me like, looked to me like maybe, maybe Afrika came in with like completely the wrong uh, approach to the game. And quite frankly, I think they choked. Like, like you say, that wasn't a strong era actually of League of Legends over there. People might know that was obviously the one when everyone got banged out in quarters or groups. There wasn't really a true contender that time because the KT super team lost. So to me, if that's all someone knows about Keane, it's like you actually don't know anything about Keane then if that's the one series you ever saw. Like he was mega before that. Then in the years since then, he had at least two or three years where he was just like, if you remember, it used to be like Summit on Sandbox and Keane on like other bad teams. And they were just on like sixth and seventh and eighth best teams in LCK, but they were both monsters. Like obviously people now know Summit because he got his chance to go elsewhere, but this guy was a beast. Like actually when you would watch him play, even on bad teams, it was like, he's still a stud. And I know apparently he was getting offers from big teams, but he's just one of those people who just rode it out for some reason. So the problem now I feel like is he actually before this KT team, he had a year or two where he was a bit more dodgy. Like ah, he was on a bit of a downturn, but this year he came back with a vengeance. And this summary is unbelievable. Like when you consider even in the LPL, there's a lot of like weak side slash tank players in top lane. Dude, he probably is the best top laner in the world. Like, to me, to me, I think it's pretty fair to give him that title, especially now with the team's results. Like, how can you really argue against it? So, I think Keane's a stud, mate. That's one of the reasons why, since I'm almost certain they're going to Worlds, this will be his chance. This will be his chance to show people he actually was, like, one of the best players to never, at least, let's say, do something at Worlds. Maybe not, obviously, went to Worlds. Then on the BDD one, this is one of those annoying things for someone like me, because I did think back in the like season seven, season eight sort of era. People overrated BDD a bit, mainly because he is a mage player. He is sort of like the is a player. And so to me, it was like he he was never like what people like Knight are now. He was never that sort of a monster. He was just like a really good mage player. Like like you could see why he could get to the finals a million times and why he's won championships. So my problem was, I just thought he was overrated. Because if you remember, he was the guy that broke that system where if you got player of the game, it was the number of those that made you the MVP of the league. It wasn't actually like a vote. And because in his right. team, because he would play like a Z and they would always play like prior mid with the jungler, just logically, if they won the game, he'd carry the team fight and he'd get through lane with CS. So he just essentially won like loads of MVPs, but it was like, he wasn't always actually the best mid laner for me. So I would always be like, nah, I don't know about that though. But then the problem is then when he had those years where the world's results were a bit more dodgy and I feel like that lost to fucking G2 in 2020. Have you noticed how for Westerner, even though we're supposed to believe everyone thinks they're as good, if a Westerner beats Koreans, the Koreans were just shit, is the premise, right? It's not actually like, oh, you know, the Western team played great. Like, that G2 team was probably the best team ever from the West, but people just act like, lol, PDD, he's trash. Even though, if you remember, that was when Caps was absolutely snapping on Silas and was just going crazy. Like, yeah. a lot of team, a lot of people could have lost to that, mate. Just the fact that he had to play damn one that made it look like you could beat him. So to right. me... I think now, like you're talking about, now BDD's probably underrated the last few years. Like, he's actually not changed much to play. Yeah, he had that one bad year on KT. I'll give him that. But aside from that, like, now he's actually just one of the best players again. Like, if you rank him mid ladies, he's going to be worst, what, like third? Still pretty fucking good, guys. I think he's mega. And then on the aiming one, the interesting thing to me is, like you say, he, he himself was on the old team where... If people don't know, he just got his career limited because he essentially said some toxic shit, I think on like a forum or something stupid. And basically it meant he got like suspended or banned for a split or something like that. And if you know in Korea, like it's all about honor and you f the public face and stuff. So as far as I know, that probably set him back in his career. Then like you say, he went to the LPL and I would actually describe to people, he is like an LPL ADC. He has really good mechanics. He, he clearly plays to them. And because of these things we've heard about, like his personality, he sounds mad spicy. He's not though, like that boring Korean that shits like I do all the correct play. He's not deft. He is like a, he is like a, a stud ADC. And like you say, the team that's set up around him, it's the best. Because think about it, right? When you have a really aggro ADC and you have the best top laner and then you have a safe mid laner, mate, what laner are they going to attack? You can always get a lead in I, the game. You can always be in the game somehow. Like, like if they start diving bot all game long, well, then Kane's just 1v1 in the top. If they go up to Kane like the junglers normally do in league, then bot lane's safe. Now you can farm it out, get the items. So... 
Because if people don't know, that thing where he got mega triggered during the Gen G game, where it was like he had, he bought the item you're not allowed to buy, even though I don't know how you can not be allowed to buy an item that is possible to buy in the game, but that's neither here nor there. So when he bought that item and he got triggered, that's why I say, I'm, I, I'm actually in on that angle. I like the fact that it's like, it's not just a typical Korean. It actually seems mega like spicy and passionate. Like I think it's a pretty cool story. So the only one concern I have about this team though, mate, is the jungler. That's the problem is jungle can... If it's the right meta, it can be really influential. So I just hope it's not like a super jungle meta at Worlds because I'm a little bit sus on cards. I always have been in his career. Like, he looks like he has some good mechanics. I've heard he many, many times has been top of Korean solo queue, but I don't know. Normally, from, I have the highest expectations if you're a Korean jungler. Like you should be like a macro god. You should be like a genius pather. It does seem like sometimes his brain lets him down a bit. What do you think? Yeah, I'm kind of on that side. Um, he's definitely, yeah, he's probably the weakest person on this team. Um, I, I think he can be a bit of a liability. Um, I do think that it's, again, a good fit for him because um, it this team, again, I think kind of like allows, uh, you know, maybe for him to make a little bit more mistakes. So I think his he's a little bit less of a liability because he really only has to help one lane because the two solo lanes are really going to be handling themselves. Like BDD, you're super not really going to worry about getting solo killed. And then Keen... Uh, you know, will be able to get ahead. I mean, he might be dodgy at times and maybe uh, he loses a lead and like gets solo killed. But, you know, for having him to be able to carry, he's going to have to be able to take some risks. Um, Because his resume is really interesting, though, because he's like... He's back on the top team again. He's always kind of been on, on top teams, even yeah. though he's always kind of been dodgy because he was on that long zoo team in 2017, also with BDD. Yeah. Uh, and then he was with the um, the the 2019 SKT team, if I'm correct. Uh, the, the one that... Uh, the one with Khan. Oh, he was. I, think people, I mean, yeah. Nick, people forget it because obviously it's not their favorite era of, of SKT. But yeah, he was on T1. Absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, you know, T1, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like being on Fnatic, like your reputation is going to be a little bit more well-known just because it's such a known team internationally. But yeah, because that was a weaker uh, era of T1 and because a Korean team didn't win Worlds uh, for, the, for, uh, for that year. Uh, I think he's just kind of forgotten. Um, but I mean, you know, he's it's he's an interesting one. I, he'll definitely be like the the key this world's um, to see. Actually, I don't think he's just the key because I'm interested in BDD this world because every world's a mid laner. I think he needs to be like a strong, like a very strong player. I think almost like a mid laner needs to like have some ability to like carry the game. Almost that kind of um, how to say that that kind of night, kind of the killer's edge. Um, which BDD certainly doesn't have, but I don't know. His history at Worlds has been a little bit like sus at times. He's never really been, he's never really been bad, but he's never really been like, you know, he's never really elevated himself to be at like the world stage. I mean, if you really think about it, every world's winner for the last, you know, pretty much ever has, you know, had some major factor in helping the team. I mean, we saw Zika last year, um, you know, popping off super heavily. Also unsurprising that somewhat unsurprising that he's fallen off. But um, of course, people thought him and King Jin were going to always stay great. But, you know, that's how people think. Um, so like, be, I'm interested how this team is going to play. But I also if team does well enough, I don't think they need BD to be the super like like, you know, the the you know, a mid laner with a little bit more killer's edge, but just because that's been the um, the history we've seen at Worlds in the past, that I'm just curious if that's going to happen or not. The problem is, it's why actually in the modern day, I think people end up underrating all the really good mage players. They do the same thing to Larson and LEC. I would even say to some degree, they do it to Faker. Now look, obviously they're counteracting all the nutter Faker fans that still think he's like God, but they underrate the fact that like he's not trying to just win lane in his case. Like he's affecting other things. In the case of the really good mage players though, it's also just kind of the role though, isn't it? Like it's, it's you don't really smash people if you play as Zero or Oriana, you know. You just get ahead of them in CS and then in the team fight, you do really good damage and your team wins the game. Whereas the difference is, if like the joke is, do you ever watch LEC? A little, not too much. I was watching, um, like I was like yesterday, I was watching the SK match. Have you ever uh, seen the Astralis play this year? Not this year, no. Right, they have a player in mid lane called Leader. And basically his entire game is he hates mages and he just plays assassins. So unironically, he will actually in LEC play like Jordan and stuff like that, like even in right. 2023. And he will play Zed if he can. And he'll play all these like crazy assassin picks. And basically, like he's not he's not the best mid, mid in the league. It never has been. But right. if he pops off, it's going to look insane. Like it's going to look like, why it's snapping? Oh my God. Because that's just the nature of those champions. So I also think the problem is as a, a mage player, 
it's just harder to look good. I would agree. He definitely hasn't played his best game there. It's actually a part that I think is really underrated about Koreans. Everyone talks as though they're the best in every area, but actually they're not all the best at being clutch. That's a myth because no region has that sort of play. You have some players who are very unique individuals and that's but actually being clutch makes you pretty unique sometimes in a team. Sometimes not even all five players are clutch. So I think what really ruined people was because Faker was not only the best player, but was also clutch. It makes them think every great player is clutch, whereas all I would say is think of any of the other players. Like, like Deft is one of the best players ever. He's actually fairly famous for not being clutch, I think most people would say. <laughs> yeah, you go down the list, there's a whole bunch of really great players who, I mean, even though he was definitely very good, obviously Khan lost a billion game fives like in all, all the international tournaments, right. didn't he? Like never would win in that scenario. So I think that's also something people just take for granted. It's why in some ways the story of Faker has ruined league for really good players at his position. Kind of like if you know the analogy, like the NBA was ruined by Michael Jordan because it again made you think that it's not just about being the best player. You also have to make the last second shot and you have to be the only player who's like carrying and then you have to also like win every single time. And it's like those, are, like look, that in a movie that would be great but in real life it doesn't really work like that and to take it all the way back by the way I, I agree because even Gen G looks a little bit shaky in some of these games even though they're winning all the series I actually do think like, even in spring because obviously you had the four teams then in spring Korea looked way better Korea looks mad sus right now like the main concern I would have I mean you're watching the LPL so we can talk a bit about that if you want but I, I'm really concerned that the LPL is going to clap them when Worlds comes. I know the problem with that is if you ever see all the Worlds, they do seem to have this weird thing from LPL where there'll always be one or two really good teams at Worlds, but there's always like the one big team that somehow gets like slapped by the patch or something and just doesn't adapt. So I know there's that historical trend, but mate, they've just got too many good teams now. Now that they send four teams, it's hard not to see LPL winning Worlds for me. Yeah, it's same for me. It's it's hard not to see them uh, win worlds. Uh, and the, the Genji, yeah, I think have problems too. Um, not not only the fact that um, you know Chovy is obviously sh shown to be like shakier and like heavier and like world's worst performances at times. Uh, I think he'll eventually like cross the boundary and you know not choke as much. Um, Peanut's the one I have no faith in because I've seen Peanut choke too many times in too many big games and throw too much uh, that I just I don't have much faith in him. And even though Doran's playing pretty well right now. I, I think the same thing. Uh, I'm pretty worried about him as well. Um, but yeah, I think LPL is just the the stronger uh, region right now. And I thought, um, yeah, I thought LCK was better last split. I remember watching T1 and um, since they had stayed with the same roster um, fr from the year before, I was legitimately thinking that if they were able to win um, at least like one international tournament or or win worlds and then win their two domestic splits i would thought i would think that they would be in conversation for the greatest team ever because of how well they were just playing at that time i was thinking that if they were going to keep that consistency that they could like really ascend to the top now that that their demise is pretty depressing um especially because you know i'm such a big fan of caria um you know i think he was at one point the best player in the world um and i still think he's playing pretty well on you know a bit of a sloppier team, uh, but it's just, it's just kind of weird right now. LCK is just kind of a mess. Yeah. The other thing that's always been so weird to me is if anyone knows the history of like proper carry top laners, Korea is the place you get them from. But what's so silly is in the modern era, they keep having all the top teams not have the carry. Like basically ever since Nagori left damn one, it's just been all these players where they're just like, whatever. Like, I guess there was Khan that one year, but you look at it like Genji with Doran. It's like, bro, imagine if that was Keen on their team, you know, which by the way, almost certainly could have happened if they wanted it a year or two ago. Then you look at D+, they've got Kana. I mean, he's right in the same basket. It's like, he could be all right. You know, sometimes he can carry. You wouldn't really want him to do it if you were going to win Worlds. You just go across the board. Like, Zeus is mega, but he has a massive choking problem, in my opinion. I think that's the thing. People looked at the other players in the team. Dude, I think the difference is Gumiyushi fucked up in the game. I actually think Zeus just straight up chokes. I think he's actually one of the worst defenders on T1. So it's just sad to me that for some reason, they just don't have, like, those super carry top players. Meanwhile, you go over to the LPL, like, obviously the one everyone loves now is fucking Bin. Yeah, but yeah. even though he's having a bad split... Ale used to be pretty fucking fire, especially a couple of years back. People don't know it, but if it wasn't for the fact they have Rulu, who's probably the best player in the entire LPL, they could definitely play through 369 and do carries. I've seen him do it a million times when he was on top esports. So that's another position, quite frankly, that I, I have my concerns about. I feel like the LPL just does it in every position, especially across all those really, really top teams, the top five to six. Korea, it's more like 
you've got to hope it's not like a top lane patch. You've got to hope that like people don't choke because I'm with you on the peanut one. Sadly, it's just been a problem his whole career. It just has. It's just one of those yeah, players has. where it's not even like he always egregious. He does it. It's just you know he's going to get worse in the game five. You just it's you're just waiting for the moment to happen where it just goes wrong. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's just it's just inevitable when it's going to happen, pretty much. What about um, what do you think of the D plus team? Because the problem there obviously is you're supposed to just look only at jungle mid ADC and go, can you ensure make her death? That should be a super team, but it just just never gets going for some reason. What do you think the issue is? You know, I'm not really sure what the issue is because I was kind of thinking the same thing and kind of watching their games and. I don't know. I don't know what it is that like doesn't get them going because yeah, Canyon and Showmaker, uh, those two, yeah, yeah, Canyon Showmaker deft, obviously, but since Canyon and Showmaker played each other for with each other for I think almost like four years or five years at this yeah. point. Um I, you you just think they would be so mega, and they honestly have been for the last couple of years. I mean, there was, you know, people would sort probably remember at Worlds, you know, Canyon, you know, tried desperately to carry um uh carry Dam one through their uh uh through their series that they lost uh the somewhat one. unsuccessfully yeah, yeah the gen g one um and he's you know uh he's been very you know like very consistent uh the last couple of years um uh my i talk um uh because i actually met him during the um uh dur- during your old live watches i talk with kiri a decent amount uh kiri the decent amount kiri oh, okay. the, the, the scottish man yeah, yeah kira thank you the one who was on um, euro news if people know the one oh euro league with rich yeah uh, and yeah, he's always been like very high on Canyon. I remember him like having him like decently, maybe not decently up there, but like in the top 20 list of all time players oh, already. Gosh. I mean, um, some people think Canyon's the best jungler ever, man. Yeah. I mean, he's like, um, I mean, I, I first saw that that was like maybe like a year plus ago and I was first like a little bit iffy, but yeah, watching him more and more. Um, I certainly think like his, yeah, his stock has definitely risen for me. He's like, definitely like it will be in contention for one of the best if not the best jungler ever uh and showmaker i think is actually somebody who's i thought in my opinion has kind of flown under the rate maybe not under the radar a little bit but like you know he's well known but like more maybe a little bit more under the radar in which i think he should be known um i actually throughout his career i could i think i could argue he's been a better player than chovy is um just not just from results um for you know not like choking as much uh but you know for just being you know, the kind of, play, you know, that kind of mid player that, you know, I think you look for at Worlds, the guy with a little more killer's edge, but can also, you know, play back at times and um, let the jungle carry. Um, I think just be, Cho, because Chovy is such a, such a big name and he's just such a massive, like uh, he's, he's another person like Chovy who, who just like massively passes the eye test. Um, and like you said before that, like players who pass the eye test are naturally going to get more hyped. Oh, nice. um, I think. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, I mean, as good as Chovy is, I'm not, you know, dissing on Chovy, but I just think Showmaker, you know, deserves to be, I think, right there with him. Um, did Kana, I remember, um, I liked Kana before when he was in T1. I thought he was a good top laner. Um, now I don't think he's been playing as well. Um, you know, he's, like you said before, like the, the top laners, especially the, yeah, the top laners right now in LCK, there's just besides Keen, there's no one with really like a carry edge. Um, you know, you don't, the team doesn't really have that extra factor. Um, Deft, I'm not really like sure. Cause I think Deft has still been like, at least this year, I think he's been playing decent. Um, uh, I remember pe- people were talking at, um, at one point, um, about him maybe being the best, uh, 80 in the league, but that was back in spring. Uh, it's he, he was because, leading like almost every stats category, right. I think. Yeah. But because Gumayushi is again, passes the eye test that, you know, people see one cool out play of him and think that he's better uh, when, you know, I agreed that Def was better um, then. Uh, but yeah, he hasn't been, I don't know if he's been bad, but he hasn't been like great to me. Um, I mean, this team, I think is just kind of floating on the fact that they've got like already like, you know, good players um, and that they're able to just be able to do decent um, in like a weaker league. They're eight and four right now. They're in third place. Um, but you know, I've heard like Monty talk about um, how he like isn't even sure if they're going to um, get to Worlds because he thinks like the bubble is going to burst and that, um, you know, he said that maybe like Hanwa will um, well, Hanwa will get there and maybe T1 can still get it to Worlds instead. See, that just shows you, mate, that even Monty is susceptible to fan ideas like just having hopium that people are good. Because I tried telling him even back in spring, like, mate, the damn one team just doesn't work, man. I know on paper, you keep looking at the roster, and you're like, it's got to, it's got to work. And like you say, Deft wasn't bad. So you just keep looking at it, like, surely there's some way it should sync up, but it just just does that, just never has. Like, think about it. Of all the, like, top five teams, so you take T1, Gen G, 
Katie Rolster, and then D plus would be in there. And then maybe you say like Hanwar's the fifth one, right? They're actually the only one that never, ever really looked like they could do anything in the playoffs. Like they just did absolutely nothing. Even Hanwar had that, they beat KT in the spring. They looked all right in like some of the end of the season games. The other teams obviously all were in contention to win. That's the problem for me is like sometimes... In my opinion, you don't get rosters that are just bad for like, I mean, not bad in this case, just not, they're not, if a roster's just like, say, seven out of 10, it's not going to, after like six, seven months, suddenly become nine out of 10. Like, there's no real reason that would change. Like, fundamentally, something doesn't work. Like, if you notice, it's actually the thing that's overrated a little bit about experience in league. If a, if a roster is good, mate, it can be good in two weeks. You know, it can just be good right out the gate sometimes and, and the synergies are just there. Things make sense. People just sort of intuitively play off each other. So I don't know what's wrong with the team. I don't know if it's a coaching issue. I, part of me is a bit scared that if you think about the last couple of years went for damn one, I could easily believe that Canyon and Shawmaker almost got too much power in the team and then they just do whatever they want in the game, basically. Whereas if you know Korean teams... In theory, they're at their best when they're very strictly run by the coach and he sort of decides right. how you're going to play and through what lane and what the draft is. So that does worry me a little bit. So I don't know. The problem with me is, especially since T1 shit in the bed, I low-key do hope D-plus gets to Worlds because my hope is this. It's at least that if they were to play non-Korean teams, then it might be interesting. Like, I'd like to see what Canyon and Shawmaker do against an LPL team. That'd be a fun matchup. I'd like to see what they do against the Western teams, man. I'd like to see if everyone thinks they're just average in LCK, which they can be. Okay, give me the best LEC team, and then let's see if they can fucking wreck them in a best of five or something. That'd be fun. Yeah, I know. That would be interesting to see. Um, I I would like to see them at Worlds, especially if... um... Faker doesn't return and, and T1 continues to shit the bed. Um, and I'm not like full on Dom and want to see T1's demise because I really did really uh, enjoy that team watching. Um, but it would be, you know, it would, I actually would like to see, you know, T1 fall a little bit and, you know, see some other teams up there. Um, yeah, I guess an L- I think there's a couple LPL teams, maybe not the top two, but I think, you know, like whatever third and fourth team goes because i think the top two teams in lpl are almost certain at this point um i, I think I'd, I'd like to see what they can do because yeah i certainly think just like you know having canyon showmaker at another worlds alone um could make things interesting the thing is though it is hard to know with the lpl teams because i think this is another reason why it's so tough to judge them when you go international like the reason why we all feel like JDG and Billy are slam dunk is not only do they dominate the league but we just saw them at MSI we saw a nice sample size we saw they can play etc the problem is for all the ones that you haven't seen the roster play at Worlds because they play within the internal LPL meta like I say if the wrong patch comes along I've heard they're just notorious for like sticking it out way too many weeks in the boot camp and not like switching to the new picks and just thinking they can make the old stuff. That's why you always have that thing where like an FPX, a top eSport, just shits the bed in the group stage. So if people don't know, there's actually a very, very strong competition for who the third and fourth spots are going to be. Like as much as like you look... I mean, obviously the rankings right now is LNG and top esports, right? There's definitely a world where the two teams below them. OMG is actually just an underrated team because people don't know the names if they never watched the LPL. Their style of play is very unique and they can definitely get wins off top teams. And then the Weibo one, unfortunately, all discussion just centers around people either overhyping the shy or saying he's absolute trash. So as a team, people don't realize like there's some really good players and especially some legacy players in that team. The problem they have is they're just the most inconsistent team ever. Like you see it, they can beat the best team, but they can also just lose to absolute bombs. So I feel like personally, I do think it's a very strong chance you have JDG and Billy Billy top two teams in the finals again, hopefully a more entertaining final than previously. But the issue for me is if you know how the LPL playoff score, man alive is the upset potential in those earlier rounds. And especially oh, yeah. like before you get to that top four, that's where if you are, I mean, it happened last time. That's where if you are someone like an LNG, oh, you're looking awesome. You have the best player in scout. You can just suddenly just get clapped. Like you have one bad series and you're done for. So the good news is I think no matter who they send, it's going to be, they're going to be the best region. But part of me, low key, like for example, I am a big rookie fan. I still think he's really good. I would love to see top there. LNG, I think Scout is probably the MVP again for me. So in that sense, I'd like to see them there. But I've just learned from long experience. You can never guarantee the LPL playoffs. Like, put it this way. When you see me for my betting sponsor, do all these different bets. Dude, I'll even do LCSBO ones. That's how much I'm willing to sort of take a gamble. I very rarely ever bet LPL playoffs. I think it's just the craziest league in the world to bet. 
It absolutely is. Um, I've seen, yeah, like certainly the last couple of years, um, I think it was 2021 when they first added uh, this kind of format, where it's like the, the top four has um, uh, has top four has losers bracket. And if you go out before that, you're just out of the whole thing. Uh, I've seen just like many upsets, you know, uh, it, many, many a times I've seen like the number one uh, team in split either like mo- like I've seen it multiple times, honestly, maybe more than I haven't seen it, like not even win the split uh i remember it happened to fpx it happened to uh, edg last time um there is always that factor um with um uh with with lpl teams uh not just uh in this in in their playoffs but also at worlds um at worlds i'm i'm also really interested to see who they're going to send um because you're right that like you know that top six, I think, is or at least the, the set, uh, third through six, I think, are all possible of going. Um, Weibo has been like a super inconsistent team. Um, so I don't know, you know, maybe they'll get it together in time for the world. But I don't know the the I'm, I'm one of those people who are quite off on the shy. So I don't really have a ton of faith in them. Um, top esports have been doing well right now. But the problem is, is that it's happened to me like two years now. Um, and I just I, I have little faith in Tien's ability um in worlds because it's happened twice now where I, what, what you talked about where like they just get a bad read on the meta and then they just the team kind of falls apart um and i think it happened to carsa a couple times too i think both back sure. in uh 2020 and 2018 uh where he just kind of got a bad read he kind of stuck on things he um prioritized some picks that weren't really necessary and the teams i think both of his teams then still got to the quarterfinals but they both fell apart where tn's both of his haven't even made it um i think people are still somewhat high on tn um just because he's a world champion and i think at times he shows very good skill um but i think even in playoffs i you know i get very like iffy on tn um and I'm just not super confident with him. I think, you know, I still love Rookie too. Um, I would still love to see him do well. Um, you know, I would hate for him to get screwed over by Tien. Um, you know, it's happened to other people before. I wouldn't be surprised if it happens to him. It happened to Knight last year. Um, but we'll see. And then, yes, this OMG team. Um, I think this is the first time an OMG team. Yeah, it's been, it's been nine years since an OMG team went to Worlds. Um, you know, people like forgot that the org is like, you know, was one of the original great Chinese orgs besides them and WE. I mean, they won like the first split uh, of China and people totally forget about that just because those players are kind of lost to time. And right now, yeah, they've got five players who, yeah, if you haven't been watching the region, you don't really know them. But I really hope this team goes to worlds because this uh the world needs to know who shanji is my god this guy is mega i was watching him last year and thinking that if this guy can stay as good as he is this omg team can be super good creme was the uh cream was the also uh the other one i was like really hyped on but shanji uh i think has just been like extremely good like decently consistent um so, you know somebody who can just take over a game uh you know people who wouldn't be looking would say like who's shanji the shy is better the shy is very far behind how good shanji is right now uh could i argue he's the no probably behind 369 in terms of being the best um top laner in the league but he's certainly uh, in contention for it. Um, and yeah, even better than Ben, which might upset people too. But, you know, if you actually watch the league, you will see that, yeah, Ben hasn't had a great as well. No, Ben's had a deep, pretty good split. Um, also the one who's had a bad split. And then, yeah, but Chanji's just been mega. No, I agree. If people don't know, basically, like the joke is you don't know them because they're not big names, but they're easily probably the most entertaining team to watch. It's actually the easiest yes. entry point. If you don't watch the LPL, just watch this team against any top team, especially if it's a three game series and you'll just see fireworks. It's great. Like I agree with you on the Shanji point. If people don't know, even though the team again, wasn't some like super relevant team last split, he was on like the all pro third team or whatever in the LPL. Like there's a reason he was up there. He's not some nobody. And then also to me, the thing is, like, this is where the LPL is just, there's just too much talent. They almost can't fail to make good teams because if people don't know, the team who fucked it up last split was EDG, where they were one of the best teams and they messed it up in playoffs. And even though they're actually sort of bombing this split because they had the scandal with Leave, who was this mega rookie, and then they replaced him with Uzi I. It was like, it's like he went, like one out of every three games, he has the throwback game. Yeah. The rest of the time, it's whatever, you know. And they're now not really that relevant a team. They're probably not going to make the playoff run, probably not go to Worlds. But that's actually a good thing. But it doesn't matter because in the meantime, like LNG got Gala. And it's like, like there's, there's just too much talent in the league. I'm with you on the, the angle about TES, though. The main concern there is this, like one, 
My joke about Rocky is he's like my mate LS. Dude, he has the worst taste in the people he surrounds himself with. Like, how do you go from IG where they've put inters around you all those fucking years right. and then come to top esports? The other team infamous for top jungle and ADC inting the mid laner. Like, you just you just signed up for the night nightmare simulator and he just did it again. So he's got a chance to go this time, at least. It's not like that fucking V5 team last year where, again, he had his chance, but it was just blown completely in the playoffs. But the TN is the one who's the nightmare. The reason why this guy's had the Dardy Award twice, I think it's not even that unlikely, which is I've heard basically from the people in the scene, it's not a meme. Dardy is like, I mean, in the West, everyone did overrated it with like high, like he was a great shot caller, but obviously people had to play their game. And I've heard Meteos had a lot of like independence and Sneaky had his own vision on bottling, stuff like that, right? But I've heard right. Doinby is like the fucking Enders game motherfucker who was just controlling the whole team and like where people path to when we fight, what we do. Like people have seen the fucking shit online where he really is, while he's talking and playing mid lane, he is typing all the timers for everything and the fucking flash and the he's, he's ridiculous. And so basically, essentially, I've heard he just piled fucking Tian when they were on the same team. So when you see Tian without Doinby, my assumption immediately is probably has really good mechanics, although even that's a nightmare because he, remember he kept claiming in those bad years that he had wrist problems. But then I imagine he just doesn't have a great cerebral view on jungle. So in my opinion, the problem with junglers, even though I have loved so many of the mechanically strong junglers in the West, like Dard, Orchid, Self, Made, I have to acknowledge eventually, like, the brain junglers are the best. It is the role for playing with your brain and reading the map and know what the enemy does and where to cover and where not to be and when to farm and when to get. Like, the problem Tian has is he's got all the flash. Everyone knows you put him on Lee Sin, he's going to go fucking ham. But he's not, like, some prime jungler in the rest of the sense of it, you know. That's the problem. He's... He, and so if you get the wrong patch, you get the wrong opponents even. So style he's never played. He could shit the bed like no one, mate. I mean, I think we've actually given him the Dardy Award like twice at this point. He's, as you say, he's a world champion. <laughs> that's pretty impressive. He can get the Dardy Award and win worlds. Yeah, that's, I mean, especially <laughs> winning the, the Dardy Award twice is I think like he's the only one who ever did, mate. Yeah. Not even Dardy won the Dardy Award twice. No, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's, um, he, he's... Yeah, he's just, I think, such a liability at this point. And you know, knowing that Dwayne B thing, I think just that make that some things make some more sense now then. Um yeah, I, I certainly think that, yeah, you you we like watching the the mechanical junglers, especially because it's you know, mechanical junglers are a bit rarer than like maybe like more mechanical mids that can like outplay. So they're always like nice uh to see. And they can't they do have the ability to carry games because jungle's always gonna be a factor in the game. Um, but yeah, the cerebral ones are always going to be the ones. Uh, that matter more. I mean, you know, Tarzan, I still like think even though well, he was in worlds in 2021, he barely didn't go to worlds last year. Um, I still, you know, think from, you know, 2019, he didn't play in 2020, you know, he's, he's another person who's like, and contend for, you know, being one of the best junglers ever. Sure. I mean, his cer uh, cerebralness on the game has just been so mad and he's just had, you know, a cons you know, consistent amount of different people he's had to play with um, and been able to work with all of them. Um, and he's, he's got a good, uh, amount of teammates right now. Um, you know, Gala as you know, I think over time, over the last like two years since 2021, since I've been really been watching him in RNG, I think he's gotten a little bit more consistent. I still think he's like iffy at times. I still think there's times when he can throw games. I don't think he's as bad as he used to be. Um, he still certainly has the ability to carry games. Um, I, I think, uh, replacing him for LP wasn't, was a bit of an upgrade, uh, but he's still like a bit of a liability for me. Uh, Scout, honestly, um, you know, really for pretty much up until this year, I was a little bit, I'm not going to say Scout, I ever thought Scout was bad, but I guess I just, my stock, you know, my feeling of like stock being an all-time great mid laner wasn't as high as I think it should have been. But just like, you know, after, you know, this this split and last split, he's probably going to win another MVP again. He should win another MVP again. Uh, looking back, you know, on his career, uh, you know, the the teams he's played with, the teams he's won with, um, you know, I've really underrated the guy. Uh, he's, you know, just been mega consistent after all these years, this, you know, great results consistently. You know, he's a world champion, of course. Um, like, I think there is some of that, like, you know, I don't know, that, that, that stepping out of Faker's shadow, like that, you know, needs to happen. But I think anybody player who plays under Faker, like, will never really get out of the shadow. Um, but he's just been, like, mega. I mean, he can... You know he can contend for one of the being one of the best players in the world. 
The sad thing is, like the reason why very recently people on Reddit might have seen there was a scandal around Scout where basically his old team EDG is going to like sue him because supposedly the story went that he's like gave his word like, oh, I'm going to leave, but don't worry, I'm going back to Korea, I'm homesick. And he gave like a reason like that. And then supposedly, this is where the people on Reddit don't know the rest of the story. Then basically EDG makes it sound like maybe that was a lie and then he just went to LNG because he only wanted to play in that team and maybe get out of EDG, which I will say is a bit... that in itself is a bit of a weird story because if ever anyone knows EDG historically is a much better org than LNG so unless he had some issue with the mm. coach it seems like a weird move to do like like at best it's a side grade so the story I've heard and I think maybe even Monty or someone said this recently or maybe it was one of his shows I heard it on was that there was some team in Korea I forget which one he says that might have been someone like like a Hanwell Life or something. There was some top team that was considering picking up Scout, basically. That's a shame that didn't happen, in my opinion. Because obviously, being a full Korean, I would love to see a player like that go back to Korea and just round out another team and make them a fucking star. And then, then let's see what happens, you know, because if people only saw Worlds... That's the saddest thing about that DRX team. Like you have such a skewed perception of ZK. He is a good player. Don't get me wrong. We actually, in in, se- in some sense, he did have like a level up because of Worlds, but he's not the player he was in that playoff run, guys. Like right. that yeah. was some miracle shit. Like I don't even know where that week came in general from that team. Same thing with King and like these guys were like one and a half times better than they should have been. It felt like, and they could play with limited champion pool. It, none of it made sense. That really was like upside down world to me, that, that week of Worlds. So yeah. if, they, if you put a player like Scout on a team like Hanwa or another team that's at least got good players, mate, he'd be cooking. He could really, really be something special. Because LNG is good, but I'm with you. Like, I've always thought Tarzan's a bit underrated. Like, it might just, I know now people have obviously changed their perspective because when he played on Griffin, you had Chovy, who already was obviously like, everyone knew he was going to be mega. And he was already, I think, the solo queue god. And then Viper, obviously, has made his name since then. He even played with Scout, but... He was clearly a very strong player mechanically as well. But to me, I actually thought Tarzan was the best Griffin player. That was when he was just, he was like the master of the jungle, mate. It looked like he could just perfectly knew, like when you have to gank, when he could just farm, nor the jungler ever had the read on him. It just looked like a mega brain jungler, but with mechanics. That's why I'm actually glad this year he gets Scout because the old LNG, that was the one with Ale, if people remember, like, yeah, it could be fun. It was not a bad team. It went to that Worlds, but you saw there, it wasn't a dominant team. It wasn't a team that he was going to, like, win Worlds on or something. Like, it would still have to be an outside chance for LNG, but you could be a dark horse. If you go to Worlds, you'd be a dark horse, I think. You'd be, like, you know, maybe the fourth or fifth best team there. Yeah, it, um, they definitely can be a factor at Worlds. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I agree with you that I think Tarzan was the best player on that Griffin team. Um, and I think maybe like going into that Worlds or at least like around that time in summer 2019, I think there's a, a, a good argument that he was the best player in the world uh, because people don't remember because they didn't win the split that that Griffin was, team was number one um, yep. uh, in, in LCK. They just got T1'd. Uh, by the end and then they only went in a second um, but they're still going in um, you know as a mega team uh, you know going into that worlds uh, yeah I'm really happy that he's got um, a mid laner uh, that he that I think is like pretty consistent like not somebody who like can you know it's not like a BDD where he's like gonna play safe and play you know smart on enchanters but you know a guy can who can be a bit more of a, a kill factor um, you know a couple years ago yeah when he went to world he had icon uh, who I thought was like very bad. Maybe not very bad, but he was he was pretty bad. Uh, I never like he was definitely the worst player on that team, along with um, uh, Light and Iwandi and and Ale, who were the other players. Uh, so yeah, he's always kind of gotten the short end of the stick. Um, and I thought this year he almost did as well because I remember looking um, before Scout um, joined. He had there was another player on their team. I forgot who it was, um, but it was another mid laner that I didn't recognize the name of. And like seeing that with um, LP and Hong and Zika, I remember giving it to um, the, giving that roster to Kiri and he was just like, Jesus, he cannot catch a break Tarzan. And he kind of, he hasn't been, you know, he hasn't had the luckiest in terms of teams for a while, uh, but I hope, you know, he's, he's got a team now that he can do well with. Um, I mean, who knows? I mean, again, the, the factor of the LPL playoffs, I mean, you know, there's, a, a, a kind of out chance that, you know, LNG could win. You know, I think it's a very out chance. I would, you know, put money on BLG or JDG, certainly, you know, but, you know, again, the, the factor of it being the LPL playoffs can, you know, make so many different things happen. You have no idea. Obviously, because if people have already seen MSI, they're going to say it has to be JDG and they are a big favorite. 
And obviously, even when they play BLG, they beat BLG. But I don't think people get it. Like, that's the only team in the world right now that can beat BLG, is JDG. Right. So you have to also throw this out there because it, league isn't a computer simulation. It's not really like, you know, one beats two, two beats three. The key thing here, if you BLG is, even if you can't beat JDG, it's not totally for certain. Someone else could do it for you. Like, what if some, what if KT beats JDG and then you play KT in the fight? Then you win Worlds, right? Like, I think people actually underestimate, like, they definitely can win Worlds, BLG. They look, in fact, I think they, they look even stronger now than they did at MSI. Like, I was wondering at MSI, was that a T1 choke? Was that a Gen G choke? I think it was a bit of that. I think actually BLG just took what they did there and just leveled up even more. They look really good. Yeah, I was curious if they were going to level up from uh, MSI because, you know, we don't always see teams, you know, have like stronger performances at an international tournament and always come back and bring it into the regular season. Um, but I'm really happy that they have. I love this BLG team, not not only of how they play, but I love kind of the story because you have, you know, early 2022, they announced like the big super team with Breathe and uh, Fofo, who was who'd shown really good promise from uh, uh, Rare Adam the year before. I think they got like fourth or third um, in the summer 2021 split. And then obviously they added Uzi I, um back, which was like, you know, the big, um, you know, the, the big hype thing uh, along with Chris. And then uh, Uzi I didn't really play on that team that much. They played with Doggo instead, who had looked really good from uh, PSG Talon. Uh, and that team just like... Pff- fell apart. I mean, they just, they never got going. They, you know, never were that strong. Weiwei didn't ever look that great. Fofo wasn't like, Fofo didn't have his greatest year. I think he's, he's looked better this year. Um, but yeah, that team just couldn't get going. And then you've got this team where you've got five players who are kind of the scraps. You've got Yagao who was kicked from JDG for night. Um, his almost like anime brethren at this point, they see each other so much in finals. It's almost like surprising. Um, and it's not even almost surprising. It is surprising. You got June who uh, kind of came in for the Ning replacement from IG uh, and didn't look great there. That was when IG was, you know, they're still going through some changes, but that's when they were kind of in mid- in the middle between um, between eras. Uh, Rookie was still on that team in 2021. Um, ben is obviously the, pe- the person that people, know um you know he's been mega before uh you know he but he's been you know he's always been somewhat inconsistent but he does have the times where he can carry games people are always going to remember the pentakill at we're in the world's finals so that will always stick in people's mind the big name for me though for this team is elk um i've been i've you know been big on elk for a while uh you know watching him back in uh we back in 2021 that was a really good we team that's when um that's what that was the team that we originally found how good breathe was uh missing was still on that team uh, and he's, uh, I think Elk is just like in a perfect team fit for him. Uh, just like a, a safe mid laner, um, allowing him to carry. And then his, just his skill has leveled up where he's looked less like, um, an LWX in terms of like a really shaky Chinese, uh, ADC who can like carry, but then in a lot of the time, uh, and it's just like leveled up his game to be like a, a top three, uh, AD carry in the world. And then on as well as, as somebody who I was like, iffy on coming from, Weibo, um, he uh, replaced uh, Sword Art and Weibo back in 2021. Back, I think they were back. They were still called Sooning. I don't remember when they were called Weibo. If that was the year before or not, it doesn't matter. Um, but he's been playing, I think, super well too. Uh, you know, certainly can be debated. I think right now for being the top support in the world. Uh, yeah, this team is just like I love it. It's just the scraps kind of pulled together, and then just shows that like five players who aren't like you know the the best in their roles being put together uh, and like are able to you know they, they were able to do pretty well uh, last split. That you know they got second. Obviously, they got fourth in the regular season, and now they have you know there's only a couple games left. I think actually tonight. Um, oh no! I'm, I'm excuse me. Last night was um, the last time they played, so they're ending up first uh, in the league. Uh, so I mean, that's just a mega accomplishment. Yeah, the weird thing, like you say at the end, there is the none of these players, with the exception of maybe Elk, who was like a rising talent. No one was ever thinking any of the others were actually the best player of the league. Even Bin used to be a lot more coin flippy. But if you look right now, like I mean, maybe Bin could be the best top player. That's certainly on the table. But I think even the rest of them, like. Still, no one thinks any of these guys are the best. No one thinks Yagao is the best mid laner. Absolutely no one thinks Elk's better than Ruler because Ruler might just be the best player in general, along with Scout right. at the moment. And then Sean is like, he's, yeah, he's, he's had a good... T- the thing to me is this team looks like it must be well coached. Like also, the, the, they're just one of those teams that... This, this is the dream concept I learned in team sports. It's like somehow you all, you all cover each other's weaknesses. So suddenly, like if, when you watch BLG play, you do think they're all really good. Like they all do look really good. And everyone's taking their turns off pop-off games and big matches and 
all of a sudden you think there's going to be weaknesses. If you do, you know, if you remember back in the day on Summoning Insight, the really, really old school way to look at a league game before we knew all these things about comps and styles was you just compared player for player, like, right, this jungler versus that jungler, this top player right. versus that top player. If you did that on paper, none of this BLG shit makes sense. Like, they shouldn't be able to beat some of these other teams. But the, the real thing, with, obviously, in team games, you learn is like when five players are all connected, they can play. The what like the one team that comes out of it can be better than a team with actually better individual players or two players that are studs and carry roles, but maybe the support and the jungler iffy or whatever. But yeah, somehow this team has gone well together. And that's why actually I will have to give a bit extra credit to your gal than I used to back in the day. Because I just get the vibe, mate. This guy is on some Nisky shit. Like every jungler he plays with just just is in their best form. Looks like they just rise to another level. So I feel like it, he has to be a factor in that. Like, he's one of those guys where basically I'm trying not to just look at him just as a mid laner. Like, I think he has to be doing something. And as you pointed out with all the times he's been in the finals, dude, he's got to be one of the greatest overachievers ever in league. Like, no one really had this yeah. guy as, like, the person who should be a champion a bunch of times, like, in the finals a million times, go to Worlds all these times. Like, he's actually had a really cool career. So, again, that's also why I'm getting sort of Nisky vibes. Like, Nisky, if people don't know, was supposed to be a middling to maybe slightly above average middling as well. As he's had the times where he has competed for MVP or he's won the championship over the better player in the role. That's actually one of the cool things about team games. As much as it's frustrating when you have a massive stud player who can't win because his team cap him, you can also have the player where they're good, but with the right team, then they can win. Like, suddenly it's not, it's not, we're not talking about like, running the 100 meters and if you're not the fastest you can't win like what's great about team games especially with the strategic component is you can win in ways other than just mechanically being the most cracked out you know yeah um i think we have to like start you know it's obviously hard from a language point but actually this player this coach is does speak english i think we have to give so, a good amount of props to tabe as a coach now uh you know because before this team uh you know he turned jiao you know jiao Hu from a mid laner to a top laner and turned him to the best top laner in the world and was able to take rng uh win two splits and win msi yeah that team kind of fell apart in the end sadly i would have liked to see them uh do more but you know him as a coach um, I, I think it's really interesting. I mean, it shows, you know, I, I still somewhat remember him back in 2013 as being, you know, like a quite bad player on a world's finals. Oh, it was team. Terrible. It's probably uh, one of the worst yeah. players to play in the finals. Yeah, he was. Um, but uh, yeah, but he was just known as well. You know, people knew his name because he spoke English a couple of times in some interviews. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, people don't watch the game. So, you know, what do I know? Um, but yeah, seeing him as a coach has been great. And then Yagao, Yagao's career, yeah, has been certainly one of the best overachievers I've ever seen. One of the strangest careers I've ever seen. I mean, you go back to, you know, spring of 2020, uh, you know, not, um, you know, people got to remember that, you know, it, you know, it was only a couple of years ago. But uh, in COVID times in 2020, uh, China still did play online, but they played online probably the least of the main four regions. Uh, they were still uh, offline a decent amount, I think, with just without crowd. Um, and like Yagao was you know, winning championships, Dan. I mean, he's won, I think, what, three splits now? Uh, yeah, yeah, he's kind of like the um, uh, the Niski kind of guy where, like, yeah, you give him Jun, uh, who I had, like, very little faith for when he came to this team, and he's of looked course. much better than I ever thought he was going to look. Um, and, the, you know, Kanavi, certainly, I, I think he's been playing well now, but he's probably been in his best form with Yagao. Uh, and then I remember seeing your tweet and just thinking about it, about how, Yagao and Knight like just keep meeting each other in finals like to you know Knight obviously being like you know Knight will probably end up going down as the best Chinese mid laner ever I think just a couple more results and he could pass Zhao Hu because it's just his skill ceiling it's just that high the fact that his like rival is Yagao like just makes no sense from like any like any person writing like, you know, a script would be like, oh, this, you know, this wouldn't make sense. This guy's like not good enough to be consistently competing against this guy. But that's just how it is in team games. I mean, uh, you know, I think he's actually gotten better th over the years. I think he's gotten a little bit more stable. Um, his champion pool has gotten a, I think, a better this year. Uh, you know, in 2022 Worlds, it was still like a bit iffy. It was a bit iffy before. Uh, in 2020, um, there was, you know, he could really... Um, yeah, he he really only played mages. He was like really really good on Zoe back in the day. His Zoe was like super mega, uh, one of the best I had seen. Um, so yeah, he's just a like such a weird player. But like he even has times where he can pop off now. I mean, he did you know he had that he was like that too. Um, in in twenty twenty two, I even th thought at Worlds that he wasn't 
like the worst player on that team when he was probably the worst player on the 2020 JDG team that went to Worlds. The debate would be between him and Loken. Um, but Yagao certainly didn't play at the worst at 2022 Worlds. That was the, that goes to hope, obviously. Um, but yeah, his just his career has been so weird, but like so fun to watch. And I'm surprised how much enjoyment I've got out of it. And I'm really glad. Yeah, I just looked it up. He's been in five LPL finals with three different junglers. Because he also, in the early days, had that guy flawless. It was like a bit of a, just like a coin flip mechanical jungler. Right. If you think about it, it's only Kanavi that's going to go down as like one of the best junglers ever. Like he's just done it with different players. Like just shows it. There's got to be something to that. There's got to be. And if people don't know, the thing with the Tarbear guy is, in a fucked up way, I'm not that surprised he's a good coach because as well as being dog shit when he was on that like Royal Never Give Up or well, Royal Club at the time, yeah, the, at the time within the Chinese scene, he was one of the people who was on one of the versions of, I think it was IG that him and like the middle and the whites left in some like drama thing where they saw, I think they like, I think they did that shit where it's like they kick someone and then they just left themselves. So you sort of like ruined the team completely for a year or two. And basically at the time he was mega hated on them. People know that famous thing where he like stupidly leaked like what someone was going to do on the broadcast. But what I would say is the other side to that same equation is I get the vibe that he's a bit like Perks because what people don't know about Perks is this used to be a famous meme back in like 2016, but everyone forgot it after that. The reason why Perks is, has all these amazing teams, even if they don't always work, is because behind the scenes Perks is a mega social guy and he really is the guy who's just friends with everyone that like is good basically and he has all the social connections so he also he always knows the gossip what's going on who's going to be available like the joke is he's the real GM if like LEC for the last 10 years like it's just him picking his teams and and sort of like obviously avoiding the poaching rules, but getting around that and lining up who he's going to play with next and then who he's going to play with after that. And so I get the vibe Tabby has some similar shit going on because just the number of different players he's been able to work with now, all these different teams, like he's clearly got something to his game. Yeah, I mean, I, I just looked at when he played on IG. Yeah, he was the support uh, uh, on IG uh, back in uh, summer of 2016, uh, which had Rookie. Um, the Rookie played as an ADC for a little bit at one point. Don't remember that. Um, but it was still when, like, Save was still playing and so when Zatai was still playing. Uh, I think that is a factor where it's like you just, like, talk with people. You know, you just hear all these things that, like, come up in conversations. You just, you know, learn about little parts of the game and you just like, kind of all, like, take notes on them, learn kind of who the players are. Uh, and I think that that's mega helps you and you know in terms of coming in coaching the game because i think just not just knowing um you know the what the players like you know play style wise or champion wise is important but just like i think knowing who they are you know can impact you a lot as well yeah he's had a he's had a strange career uh both as you know uh 80 uh support and as coach um but you know it's you know certainly something that'll you know be memorable at the end of the day like, I'll give everyone a little teaser here and we'll close it on this. I, basically, I've got some content coming up. I won't say what it is, but it's going to be a very interesting piece of content that a lot of Western fans will be interested in. And basically, within it, I will actually tell a story that ties into what we're talking about, where basically knowledge of other players on other teams and what they do and things you've maybe heard leaked from scrims and stuff actually helped a player win a championship. Like it's going to be when people find it out, they'll actually even know the championship I'm referring to, but they never heard the story before. This is going to add a totally new dimension, but it's going to show why what we're talking about is not like a minor thing. Like, yeah, it's not always going to matter, but every now and then you're going to get like an edge or an angle on someone. They're not going to know you have it, which is crucial. And you can potentially use it to your advantage. Either you can level your team up, you can even something out. Or in this particular case, you can just straight up exploit someone and you can just get a win where maybe it should have been more competitive.